My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the Clinton School and, and, and welcome to the first in our series of fall programs. Though I say fall uh, <laughs> in terms of school year and calendars, and not in terms of weather, but uh, at least it's cool in here. And this starts the beginning of a, of a, of a fall series um, of the Clinton School Speaker Series under the leadership of Nikolai De Pippa, which I believe uh, proudly. Uh, is the best college speaker series in the country. And Nicolai de Pippa deserves a great deal of credit. <laughs> I want to uh, introduce a couple of people. First of all, please join me in welcoming the president of the University of Arkansas System, Dr. Alan Sugg. Executive Director and my friend of the William J. Clinton Foundation, who does a great job running this complex, Stephanie Street. <laughs> Could I also ask you to turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? And as I mentioned, this is the beginning of the fall series. We have with us today uh, some people who are uh, arriving here to begin. Uh, Orientation on August 14th and classes on August 22nd. Uh, it will be the seventh Clinton School class. Um, we're welcoming our students back uh, who are, it will be their second year. They are returning from 19 uh, countries, 31 different international projects. Many are in route back home from uh, all over the world. So our students are slowly but surely coming back. But for all the Clinton School students that are here, uh, old and new, would you raise your hands? Yeah. Earlier this week, Nikolai and I were talking, and, and, we, and I said, Nick, you know, we, we've got a lot of good programs, but I said, goodness gracious, this debt ceiling agreement uh, is so uh, powerful and so important that we need to get somebody to uh, uh, to speak on this. And, and the phone rang about three minutes later, and it was Congressman Griffin who said, would you be interested in Kevin McCarthy's views about what's happening in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> Having watched Brian Williams' show, by the way, on Inside Congress a few days ago, and realizing the meteoric rise of Congressman McCarthy in the House, I said, sure. Are you kidding? Does a bear go in the woods? Of course we'd be loving that. And he said, well, how about Friday? And we put the notice out Wednesday, and look at this crowd, considering we had plane delays and all sorts of stuff. So thank you all for being here. And a special thanks to Tim Griffin for uh, his support of the Clinton School. Uh, I really appreciate that. Tim Griffin was elected to Congress in 2010. He serves on the Veterans of, of, of Armed Services, the, the Judiciary and the Foreign Affairs Committee. But prior to his election to Congress, he served uh, as a, in the War in Iraq, the JAG Corps, in the Bush White House as U.S. Attorney. Uh, he is one of the most active campaigners, enormous energy, He's got a series of town meetings all over this district over the next couple of weeks that I don't think any political figure, at least in my long memory, uh, uh, that extensive uh, uh, input uh, from his home district. I don't think there's anybody in the state that can outwork him. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'm very grateful for his friendship and for his help in helping us here at the Clinton School. He and Elizabeth had two lovely children, and as I learned today, I guess this is leading the Congress congressman, that his daughter actually punched the button when Tim voted for the debt ceiling agreement. So <laughs> at least that beats somebody voting absentee in the Arkansas legislature. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the congressman from the second district of Arkansas, the Honorable Tim Griffin. Thank you. Uh, I had my daughter do that so that I would have plausible deniability no matter what happened. <laughs> I didn't do it my four-year-old did. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you all for being here. 
it's a great crowd, and I really wanted um, uh, the whip, Kevin, uh, to come to a, uh, a welcoming crowd, and there's always uh, great questions and uh, really interesting folks who come here uh, for these. And so thank you so much for doing this, particularly on short notice. Uh, I want to mention a, co a couple things um, about uh, Kevin before I, I turn it over, and, and one of them is going to be a little embarrassing to me, but but you know it's all in the past, so it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> when I got into the race for Congress in, in 2009, uh, I got a call from uh, Kevin McCarthy. And uh, Kevin was the deputy, chief deputy whip at that point, uh, and Eric Cantor was the whip. And he asked me, he said, you know, have you thought about who you want as your mentor? Because we assign mentors uh, in the house so that you know the way things work and, and you have somebody to go to uh, if you have questions about what's going on. And I had this message, and I remember saying, I want Eric Cantor as my mentor. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But who do you want for your mentor? <laughs> I said, I want Eric Cantor. He came down here, and he was real nice to me, and I think he would like to be my mentor. And, uh, and I'm sure Kevin was scratching his head going, who is this guy? Well, you know, at the time, I got off the phone and I asked him, I said, who is Kevin McCarthy? <laughs> I now know who Kevin McCarthy is. Um, that was not because he um, it wasn't somebody, it was because I was ignorant. Uh, uh, I now, and I quickly learned who Kevin uh, McCarthy was and is. And, and I will just tell you, um, of all the folks that I work with uh, in the Congress, if you're looking for genuine and uh, easy to get along with and a straight shooter, you're, uh, that's Kevin McCarthy. Um, and uh, I'll let him tell you more about this, but the one thing that I, the story I really like is how he won the lottery, wasn't a big amount of money, but won the lottery, I think you were 20 or so, 21, and started a deli with that money and did very, very well. And that led him into politics. Uh, the, the other thing I will mention is in 2006, you were first elected, and he's already the whip. That's impressive. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that folks around him have a lot of trust in him, and they like him a whole lot. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here, and please give a warm welcome to my friend, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. Uh, you ever have one of those guys close the gate on you while you're standing waiting to get on the plane? <laughs> and they delayed you to landing. That was my moment. I expressed to him my concern to the point that I thought someone's going to come and arrest me, so <laughs> I moved on. Um, as Tim said, I have a little different upbringing and background. I, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a poli-sci professor, but let me tell you how I got into politics. I grew up in this little town of Bakersfield, about the size of Little Rock. And um, if you don't know where Bakersfield is, it's in the Central Valley of California. If you ever read The Grapes of Wrath, it is the shanty town that everybody ended up in. Cesar Chavez is buried in my district. My district is um, kind of an ag and oil district. We produce a lot of stuff. Anybody ever eat a baby carrot? I'll tell you a story of baby carrot. There are two families in my district that grow 80% of all the carrots in the country. They invented the baby carrot. You know what the baby carrot is? It's a big carrot chopped and we charge you more. <laughs> But we appreciate you for the effort. So um, that's what we are. We're, we're an ag community. And um, I grew up in a family that were all Democrats. And I was the youngest in my family. My, my, my father was an Irishman. My mother was Italian. And uh, it was all the background of the Central Valley. And my father was a firefighter. And my mom worked odd jobs. And we, we just grew up, went to public school. And when I got out of high school, um, I didn't quite have the grades for a scholarship. And I didn't quite have the athletic ability for a scholarship. My parents didn't have the money to send me to college. So we have a junior college system out there. And I went to the junior college system. I got a job as a seasonal firefighter chopping weeds. And I'd take my money. And, and Bakersfield's two, about two hours from north of L.A. And I'd go down to L.A.'s car auction. And I'd buy cars. And I'd bring them back and sell them to pay my way through college. And in California, we have an initiative process. And someone put an initiative on the ballot to have a lottery system to help pay for the schools. And it passed. Now, I actually voted against 
against it, but it passed. So um, I'm 19 years old. It's a Friday. It's the second day of the lottery, and I'm on my way to the grocery store to cash a check because I'm going to go down to San Diego State to visit some buddies that are at college. And I'm standing in line with a friend of mine. I said, hey, if I win the lottery, I'll give you 100 bucks." Well, my first ticket, the most you could win at the time was $5,000. Okay, so I win $5,000. I scratch off three. I've never played the game before. And it says three said 5,000. The way I read it, said, I walk back up to the lady and said, I think I won. You know, and everybody screams. And think for a moment. If it, this is in the 80s when money, really 5,000 was something here. And I'm 19 years old. I could do one of two things. I could be Charlie Sheen and throw a big party on my campus. Or I could invest it. So I took all my money and I invested it in one stock. I first took my family to dinner, then what I had left, I invested it. And I did pretty well. Well, at the end of that semester, I said, you know what, I'm not going to go back to college next semester. So I took my money out of the market, I refinanced the current car I was selling, and I went and opened a business. I didn't put a lot of thought into it, I just called it Kevin O's Deli. But it was like Subway before Subways, right? Fresh break bread, I had all these different sandwiches. Food critic came in and compared me to a new big restaurant. My business doubled overnight. I'd sell out every day. But I soon learned what regulation did to me. I still remember the day in my, my, my business, it had all glass windows up front. If you ever owned a small business, it's 24 hours a day. So I'm in there real early in the morning cutting up the vegetables, and there's a knock at the door. I look outside, and it's a little pickup truck from the city, and I'm thinking, they probably want to give me the key to the city, right? How many 20-year-olds have? So I go unlock the door, and the guy wanted to give me a ticket. I said, you want to give me a ticket? What for? He goes, your sign out front, you know? You're past seven days. I put in a little vinyl sign trying to get attraction, you know. I said, let me understand this right. I put a sign out front to sell more sandwiches, it pays more tax, it pays your salary, and you want to punish me for doing that. Yeah. I quite don't understand how this works. And I went through a lot of different points. Well, at the end of two years, I now had enough money that I could pay my way through college. And I knew if I didn't finish college then, I was never going to finish it. And no one in my family has ever finished college. So I sold my business and it set me up to pay me for the next year. So I didn't have to, and I look in the newspaper and it has this, become a summer intern in Washington, D.C. with my local congressman. You know what I think? How lucky he'd be to have me, right? <laughs> so I apply and he turns me down. So I go back to him, I don't want to take no for an answer, and I said, you know, I don't have to go to D.C. You don't even have to pay me. Just let me cut papers. I want to be involved in the process. I thought I'd meet some people in business. That'd be a good opportunity. So he let me do that for a couple months. And lo and behold, he started paying me 100 bucks a month. And that's what got me involved in politics. He, he then went on to become chairman of Ways and Means. But I got my undergrad in business. I started a couple other small business. And then I went back and got my MBA. And in California, if you ever want to look at, if you think the country is on the wrong path, in California, we always think we're ahead of everybody else. Well, we are when it comes to the debt crisis and everything else, okay? Every crazy bill comes from California first and then goes across the nation. Well, I decided California was really messed up that I was going to run for the state assembly, and I did. And I, I got elected in one of the smallest classes the Republicans have had. It was the first time since 1886 no Republican won statewide. And it was really on a lot of the same issues. I served there two years. And in my first seven months, I got elected leader. It was the first time a freshman ever got elected leader, you know, and people say, oh, my mom would tell me it's all about me. It was all about term limits, and nobody else wanted the job, pretty much. But we recalled the governor. Never happened before. It was a big frustration out there. Then I ran for Congress. Um, I've just started my third term. And I believe in continuing education. You should always try to learn from no matter what process you're in. And the first term, it kind of just affirmed we needed a lot more accountability when you watched Washington. I mean, I came in 2006, the smallest Republican class in the history of Congress, because it goes to 1914, and that's when we expanded. There's only 13 of us. It was a big wave. And um, the next term, I kind of learned we need a lot more adult supervision, if you ever watch how the floor works. But the last two years, the best way to describe what happened inside that house, and there's enough blame to go on both sides of the aisle, but the way the house was run, I'm a firm believer that structure dictates behavior. But those last two years, the only way to really describe it is, um, you all know that old story of the older gentleman that had a heart attack? Have you ever heard that story? Well, this guy, he's like 85 years old, and he has a heart attack. And he's been married to his wife more than 60 years. And he wakes up in the hospital, and he sees his wife. And he looks at her, and he goes, you know, honey, you have always been there for me. Remember when we first got married, I had to come home and tell you I got fired? You stayed with me. 
When I could not find another job, I joined the military. You joined the nurses' corps to be near me. When I went out and got wounded by my own men, you cared for me. Came home and had those two beautiful daughters, you raised them. When I went out and became an entrepreneur twice that ended in bankruptcy, you stayed with me. Now here I have that heart attack, I wake up and who do I see? I see you. I'm beginning to thank your bad luck. <laughs> But if you think for one moment, here it was that um, not very often do you get a big sweep like that, where in 2006, the majority party got thrown out. And I, I never quite believe that the minority wins the election. I believe the majority loses the elections. I believe that same thing happened. I, I don't believe we won a mandate. I believe we were the alternative. Um, and in 06, the cycle was really bad. And, and I broke through it, and there was only 13 of us, and not one of us defeated somebody on the other side. And I really felt like Republicans were, were not being on offense, weren't saying what they were for. And it was kind of, you demonize the other person to win. And I, I really didn't believe in that. So I got together with a guy named Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan, and we created something called Young Guns. That we thought, a lot of people are talking, Time Magazine had that the Republican Party had to um, retitle themselves. I just thought we should, have campaigns based on policy. Because if you, if you watch real elections and you study them, policy matters. And many times when you watch the history, those who play to politics may get along for a little while, but the politics doesn't work in the end because the policy has to stand for something and whether we're, where we're at. I think in today's nature, for too long, we've been going on politics, not on policy. And I do believe in this country, and I do believe that we're at a turning point were much like what drove me to sign up for the party I believed in. My family are all Democrats, but my family weren't political either. But I remember watching a guy on TV, a president, put a sweater on and tell me my best days were behind me. And another guy stand up and say, no, let's fly the bold colors, no Pascals, and let's go to that shiny city on the hill. I said, I knew, I knew neither, but I knew I believed America was better and we needed to go there. So I believe we're a little around the time that we were in the 1980s. And we have a big decision to make. So part of, part of my role in being Deputy Whip, I also had a job on the outside to be the recruitment chairman. So I went around the country recruiting candidates. And I would never ask anybody to run. I always ask them why they wanted to run. And I always tell this story that um, when I first knew that the majority was in play. I'd gone on the road and um, I had watched the president swear in with three million people. I was very impressed because I said if Republicans had won, we couldn't fill a gymnasium and here's three million people out there. I was impressed that here, here's a man who won, not based on the color of his skin, but on his merit. I thought America was a, a tremendous place, that we, can, we have grown to that point. I thought Barack Obama was an unbelievable campaigner. He, he instilled the hope to individuals and others. I didn't vote for him, but I thought he instilled us in a place that people were going to get together. I went out across the country recruiting at a time where his, his ratings were about 69%. So you think you couldn't find anybody really to run. And I'd go on the road and I first, when Boehner first asked me, I said, well, how much is our budget? You know, I want to know what I can spend and where I can go. And he said, well, we're in a deficit. How much money do you have? You know, so I don't have much. So I'm going low key and I go into Illinois first because they have the earliest primary and I recruit through Illinois and I just rent a car and I forget my Garmin and I realize I'm in Wisconsin when I'm supposed to be in Iowa so I do a U-turn. I go all through Iowa, my view never changed, it's a cornfield but I keep recruiting all the way through. I fly into North Carolina, recruit in North Carolina and I'm gonna come into Tennessee. Because I look at the point that if we really wanna have a debate about in the country, people have to be challenged on their beliefs. And I don't think it's a negative thing. I think it's a negative thing if you run negative campaigns. But I think it's a positive thing if you run something about policy. Even if you have great contrast, then the voters get to decide the direction where the country wants to go. I mean, I think one of the great falters of um, what happened with President Bush, he wins re-election on national defense, and then he walks out and says, we need to do something about Social Security, and everyone says, well, we never debated that. So you get in this real problem. So when I'm in Tennessee, I'm about to fly into Tennessee from North Carolina. I've been traveling about a week, right? And I've been kind of tired. My staff calls me and says, you're supposed to fly in and meet this guy. You're going to run against um, an individual, against this Democrat incumbent that no one even challenged last time. He's got a million dollars in the bank. 
and they said, this guy you're supposed to meet with doesn't want to meet with you. I said, well, why didn't he want to meet with you? He said, well, you're from California, he thinks you're all fruits and nuts out there, he didn't think it's worthwhile. I said, that's all right, just have him come in. So I go in there and I sit down, and I'm, you know, I just have a cardboard table, and meet with different people. This guy comes in, he goes, um, I'm Stephen Fincher, and I'm from Frog Jump, Tennessee. I said, well, Stephen, that's great. What do you do for a living? He says, well, I'm a farmer. So what do you farm? He said, I farm cotton and other things. Well, I asked Stephen this question. And I tell you this story because the answer he gave me is pretty much the answer that almost every person, Tim and others, gave me. And I think it's a very positive sign. I said, why do you want to run? And Stephen Fincher told me that... Um, he said, I've watched a country change before my eyes, and I don't know how I tell my children I do nothing. I said, Stephen, that's a good reason to run. Stephen then says, well, I don't know if I'm the best person, though. I've never been elected before. I said, well, this is a good climate for that case. He said, but I may lose my farm over this, but I think this country is worthwhile. He said, but I've got to be honest with you, Mr. Kevin. I've never been to Washington, D.C. on vacation. I said, well, as of right now, you're my top recruit in the nation. Stephen Fincher ran, and Stephen Fincher ends up now being a member of Congress. But that same answer that he gave me that it's about this country is where we have to come to. I don't care which party you are in, we are at a point that each time in this country you can find little points where the country rose to the occasion. We serve in a capital that has a dome that is the second dome that was put on during the Civil War, not knowing where the country would stay together. We have challenges that are in a di different place. Normally when we have a debt limit increase, no one even hears about it. But we're at a point where it's now not even just the ability to pay it, it becomes a national defense issue. And that's why it's healthy to have this debate. I know people don't like it on the outside, but it was healthy on the inside. Now you brought up the idea that Brian Williams, anybody watch that Brian Williams day in the line? Okay, so Brian Williams comes into my office being the whip and he says, uh, now, how are you getting the votes? What are you offering them? A new bridge or anything else? Well, in the old days, that's how it worked. In the old days, that's what helped get us in the problem. Because every bill you wanted to pass, you added to the debt because you were, in essence, helping somebody spend more money to get there. When the new Congress came in, we outlawed that. You know what I offered people? I got all the final 15 no's in the room and I gave them pizza. They're not going to move because of pizza. I didn't even ask them what type of pizza they liked. It's going to be on the merits of the bill itself. So let me walk through you some of the challenges, and I want to get into discussions and take your questions. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, everybody has applied and added to this problem. Okay? The problem has been probably shot a little higher, I believe, under the current president because of the policy of where they think they want to spend more. You just look at discretionary spending. In three years, it's gone up 84%. Well, you can't sustain that. We can't continue to borrow 40 cents out of every dollar. And I want to give you one story where you understand how large the debt is, and I'll put it in perspective. A year ago last February, America did two things. America sold weapons to Taiwan, which we've done many times before. China was not happy with it. I mean, if you look at our debt, there's five countries that own the largest portion of our debt outside of us, China being the largest. If you know where we sell our debt, we sell it down in DC. It's in a nondescript building, a little smaller than this. It's a little glass room, and we have an auction every Monday and Tuesday. And other, some weeks it's Wednesday, and some weeks you also add a Thursday to it. Well, China did not like the idea of us um, selling our weapons to Taiwan. We also did something else that month that we normally do every year. We allowed the Dalai Lama to come to America, and he went and visited the president. This time he had to leave out the back door with no pictures being taken. Something happened in that debt sale the next time. China sold some of our debt than buying our debt. So what it was saying to us, it was sending us a message. Now why as a country would we ever put ourselves in a position that that determined it? Now you just watched the last month. Had the debt increase not been there, we would have had a slash 40% the next month. Now if something bad happened to you in your life, I mean in my family, I could sustain maybe three months, but it's not the exact next month amount. That's poor management that we're in this predicament, so we have to do something different. Now, if I take you to my home state, where we pride ourselves in being advanced of everybody else, I want to give you some scary numbers. California is further advanced in the debt problem, okay? In California, the census just came out, we have 37 million people live in my home state. 
Okay, that's 12% of the entire nation. 12%. Do you know what percent of the entire um, percent of welfare we have in California? If we take everybody on welfare that lives in the nation, how many of them live in California? You'd think roughly 12%, right? We have 32%. The entire nation on welfare lives in California. Now, if you compare that to another big state like Texas, Texas has roughly 5 to 6% of the nation's population, but 2% of the nation's welfare population. Now, we get 25% of our entire budget in California from 144,000 people out of 37 million. And what that means is, in a big macro perspective, if you punish wealth creation, you get less of it. If you reward government assistance, you're going to get more of it. But you cannot sustain that model. And if you take it in the broader spectrum of the United States, you cannot borrow 40 cents out of every dollar and sustain that movement. Our budget has gotten so large, it's 3.5 trillion, but we borrow 1.5 of that. So if you wanted to say, and Tim and I sit down all the time, if you take away all discretionary spending and all the military, cut it all, we'd still have a deficit. And then there's 10,000 people every day that get added to the rolls through Social Security or Medicare. They meet the criteria. They get it. So how can you get out of this problem? Well, yeah, you can't let government run amok, but you also have to grow the economy. Now, there's a lot of people out there, they see what happened in the stock market yesterday, they see the jobs report today. We have to run 250,000 new jobs each month. I mean, if you take last month's job numbers, Canada, which has fewer people living in Canada than lives in California, we have 7 million more people than what Canada has, they grew more jobs than we did. That's just not the perspective of what we look at our country. So, to me, we're at a pinpoint. We're at a place of where we have to make a fundamental change, and it has to be everyone together. Now, I've always admired what people thought of America. And I love the idea of what Winston Churchill said of America. You know what Winston Churchill said of America? You could always count on Americans to do what's right after they exhausted every other option. <laughs> Well, our idea at a point where the President Obama came in and said government had to spend to create jobs, I think that has played out. I, I, I was excited when I pulled in. I, I love going to presidential libraries. I looked over and you had an Elvis sign up there. Um, I remember when I was deputy whip, one of our biggest votes was the um, stimulus bill. And that was the pinpoint. Um, Washington Post was, talked to me yesterday and they said, when did you know that there was going to be a fundamental change in Congress when you're a minority. I said, in the stimulus. And they said, why? I said, because I watched the minority party write their own bill. Many of you don't know, we wrote our own stimulus bill, and it was scored. It created twice as many jobs with less money because it focused on the private sector, and it, got, it let people keep up their own money and make investments. We all voted no, not because we voted against the president's bill, because we voted for what we thought was a better policy. That was a healthy debate. Now, in my other hat of being the recruitment chair, I loved the idea when the election came around, you know more people believe that Elvis was still alive than the stimulus created a job. So this is a perspective of where we're at. So what you found was we're now at a new point, that you cannot think that government's just going to spend to create. So what it's going to come down to is it has to be real tax reform. But to have this body in Washington, to have a real discussion of tax reform, where you're not demonizing one another before you start, is going to take people that are going to put the country first. And the way I look at the debt limit increase, Republicans staked out from the very beginning. We understand what the debt limit increase is. It's not about future spending, it's about past obligations. Well, Americans are going to pay what they said they would pay. But we're not going to continue going down the same path. All right? I view it like a good company with some mismanagement. And the shareholders came in and changed part of the board. Well, our role as part of the board is that we said, we will increase, but we have to have as many cuts, because you cannot continue to live this way. We also want to see that the growth doesn't get to 84% again. So you have to have some type of caps. Control in the growth of government. We've got that in there. And then we want to look long term. So we said, why don't we have a debate on the balanced budget? 49 states have it, some statute or others. We came one vote away 16 years ago to having a balanced budget. Just think, had we won that vote, would we be having a debate on the debt limit today? Or would we be debating something else? Then I streamed to something else. 
I go to the point of the person that moved me in politics. If you go into my office, you'll see a portrait of Reagan, you see one of Lincoln. I think Lincoln was an, an, an amazing man who rose to the occasion. I think that's what Winston Churchill says that we'll do at the time. I watched Reagan from the point because I watched Reagan reach both parties. And he reached both parties, not based upon party, but based upon American. That, yeah, this country can be better, that we, we would accept what our challenges are, but we would rise to the occasion. He talked about that shin, shiny city on the hill. When he said that, everybody knew it was America, and he never had to mention it. Now, we all understand that as America today, but we'd all admit that shiny city on the hill, that that light's been dimmed a little. So if you ever ask me, what is the charge of Congress? It's to climb that hill. And that hill is not a one-day hike. We're probably going to have to reach a certain altitude and stop, get acclimated, get some more protein in our body. We're going to have to, we can't do it alone. We're going to ask people to join with us, whether, what other party you're in. And if you ever climbed a major mountain, we're going to tie a rope to one another. Because at times we're going to slip. At times we might take a misstep, but we're going to be there to pull each other back. But you don't want everybody to take a misstep and pull everybody down. And when we get to the final top of that hill, our goal should be that we recharge that light that it burns brighter than it ever has before. That it is just not a light of idea of our country, it's about freedom, it's about liberty, and it instills and powers into other countries as well. Now the thing that always amazed me the most, I believe the country is turning, but you don't know that till you study it in history. That we are on a path that will turn, that we are about to wake up and have that debate. That we know what makes us great. There has been no other country like us in the history of the world. Think for one moment. There have been other countries that have freedoms, but there has never been one that will sacrifice their own lives and their money so others can have freedom as well and ask nothing for it in exchange. That is unique about us, and we have to keep it and instill it. So I believe this debate is going to be healthy. I believe the debate we just had was good. I believe the bill that we have is not a great bill, but it's a good bill. Remember where we started out, that you just wanted an increase with no cuts. Well, that's continuing the past behavior. As Dr. Phil would say, past behavior indicates future behavior as well. Well, we just changed our future behavior. Then we put limits in that you couldn't even get when Republicans were in the majority or Democrats were in the majority. You hadn't had these around time since Grand Rudman. You, ha you had them a little time around Clinton, and once we got the surplus, Congress voted them out themselves. Well, let's get back to that point, and we'll be much stronger. So, when people talk of the negative sense of where we are in government, I find more people are paying attention, more people are able to lose a, an election, that it's a healthy thing, that you can debate ideas, and when, once you debate ideas, you can move forward. I think this next election is all going to be about jobs, and it's all going to be about our economic prosperity for the future. What are the hopes and what are the dreams? And everybody in Congress is going to be held accountable. I happen to belong to the body that has the lowest rating in the history of Congress. It's not something I'm proud of. But you know what? I would never want to serve when everything was perfect because you'd have no say. And let me say this a little bit about your member of Congress. I've never seen a person not afraid to lead. That's what you want in a member of Congress. There's a lot of people that can go to Congress and sit back and say, I can guarantee you I can get reelected. And that's normally what happens to a freshman. They think their number one job is to get reelected. And this freshman class, and led by Tim, their job is to do the same thing as Stephen Fincher said. I want to change this country. I want to make it better. And you know, when you go out and lead, everybody can pinpoint where something's wrong. But when you lead is when you take the bullets. And this guy has led not only just in the freshman, but inside our own conference. And that's the background that he has that, I, that one, I admire, but I think a district instills in you. Those are the values, and you want to bring those values to Washington so they don't lose them. So let me stop there so I can take any questions you have and just say thank you and God bless. All right, we've got questions. Thank you, Congressman. Now, to raise your hand and please wait until the microphone gets to you, okay? Uh, Jeremy, you have a question right back there in the back.
Congressman McCarthy, Congressman Griffin, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Jeremy Haggard. I am the development director at City of Little Rock, North Little Rock. Um, and I'm also an alum of AmeriCorps, which is a program, uh, City of is a program of AmeriCorps. As I'm sure you also know, AmeriCorps is a uh, federal investment in the nonprofit sector to help meet uh, critical community and school needs across the country. And um, what most people don't think about AmeriCorps, though, is that it's also a job creation. And we're always hearing about jobs, jobs, jobs. And AmeriCorps really has the capacity to create jobs as well. CollegeGrad.com, which is the number one site for college graduates, um, uh, number one job site for college graduates, recently named Teach for AmeriCorps, another uh, AmeriCorps program, and uh, was number two, and City Year was number nine in terms of the biggest, uh, the biggest creators of jobs for college graduates. So how can we uh, make sure in this era of budget cuts that AmeriCorps remains strong? Well, I think anything that we fund when it comes to government, we, we should start with zero-based budgeting. And everything should meet a criteria. Is it achieving the goal that we asked it to achieve? Is it cost effective? Is there a more efficient way to do it? There's nothing wrong with challenging it. The, the, the problem that I have, anytime you bring something up, people say, oh my God, you're going to cut it. Well, no. Why don't you have to be held accountable? I mean, one thing that we did on the floor, which is much different with being a whip is probably every whip before it doesn't want to have happen. I wrote this little thing called Pledge to America. We said what we would do why we were in the minority if we ever got to the majority. Um, and the first thing it said was it was going to open up the floor, that you were going to allow anybody to bring up an amendment. In a probes, for the last two years, no one got in a probe bill and no one got to offer an amendment. Well, that's taking away the power no matter what, what office you're from or what district you're from because you have no say. I think no matter if it's my idea on the floor, if it's no good, it should fail. And from the same point, I just believe accountability. If the statistics are right, then you hold it up. And if it's a good investment, we'll make it. But also, there's a lot of good investments that I make in my own household, but when times get tough, I have to cut back even on good investments. So we cannot be afraid to say that. And if we're afraid to do that, we're never going to get out of this problem. But the one thing that I, I would tell you, if you want to focus on job creation, don't focus on big corporations, focus on small business. And I'm going to tell you, give you some statistics to, to understand that and understand where we are. If you measure from the last end of the last recession to the current recession, that takes you from 2001 to 2007. Pretty good years in America. Well, if you study companies that have 500 employees or less, they added 7 million jobs. Those were small businesses. If you study companies that had 500 employees or more during that time, they cut a million jobs. They subtracted a million jobs while small business added 7 million. If you look today, startups in the last 16 years are at its lowest point. So if you think, what does the future hold where the startups are the lowest? Remember what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur never takes a job from somebody, they create jobs. The strength of America is you want more entrepreneurs. That's why I even say, we should go down to even to a lower level. You talk about what that teaches kids. What about if we created an entrepreneur IRA? That I'm a kid from any walk of life, that I happened to grow up in Bakersfield and I was mowing lawns. But I knew I took some of my money, I could save it and go buy five more lawnmowers and make five times as much money. At the end of the day, I'm probably not going to be a gardener, but I'll tell you what, I'll be creating jobs. You instill something into individuals instead of thinking the only way out is another way. The one thing about America, and I come from California, we have Silicon Valley up there, you know? It's where the chip was made, it's where apples, where everything grows that you see, right? We created Silicon Valley at the same time in the 1950 that we were competing with Russia. Remember, Russia spent Sputnik up before we did. And if you ever go see Tim, go, go into the store, you could buy one of those astronaut pens. Have you ever bought one of those where they could write upside down? They cost 10 bucks. We invented that during, during the space race with Russia. It's, it cost us $1.2 million. Now, the Russians had the same problem, couldn't write upside down. So you know what they did to their restaurants? They gave them a pencil. But, <laughs> but why I tell you this, there were three things you needed to make Silicon Valley work. OK? You needed mathematicians, and you needed sand to create a chip. Well, Russia had as much sand as we did, and they, they actually had a little, few more mathematicians than we did. But we had a third element that they did not. We had freedom, and they did not. So anytime people sit back and say, okay, 
our next generation, we're going to be competing with India and China. I agree with them. That's who we're going to compete with. But my money's going to stay in this country. You know why? As long as we develop the entrepreneur, but as long as we allow people to fail. In other countries, you cannot fail. We learn from failure here. And that is the idea that when you look at a lot of this legislation, wants to eliminate risk and all that, well, if you eliminate risk, no one's going to make the investment because I get no reward. I wouldn't have taken my money and put it in the stock market that if I knew if it grew, you're going to take all the money away from me. Or I wouldn't have put it into the small business. If I was successful, you're going to punish me for it. But I also didn't go in thinking if I failed, government's going to bail me out. I said it would be a good example, a good experience for me. Question. Yes, sir, right here. Right there. Congressman, thank you for being here today. Uh, welcome to Arkansas. Uh, you touched on early on in your speech on the agricultural component of your district, and obviously Arkansas has a pretty significant agriculture-based economy. Um, and maybe this is a politics versus policy question. Um, illegal immigration has been a topic that's been discussed. It's probably not on the front burner now, but has been uh, quite a bit. Uh, things like E-Verify and other proposals. What do you see as uh, a proposal that can be passed that can work, but also takes account the needs of the agriculture industry. Uh, can there be an ag component to that so that those type of workers are still able to help uh, on farms? I, I think there has to be. Look, we live in a worldwide economy. The advantage that we have when it comes to ag is not the cost of our land, not the cost of growing, our intelligence of doing it in a much bigger way. Um, but we need assistance with that. The idea that this country became great by being a melting pot, that we're going to shut everything out, is not positive. I believe you have the old Bercero program. There is a way to do that where I come from an ag community that many people come in and help and they go back home. But you've got to have a check and balance. You've got to be able to trust the system, but you've got to have a system that actually works. I mean, we can ship packages and track them in the United States, but we have a border that doesn't know what's happening. That's not safe when it comes from a national security point of view. I believe in today's world we can get to both. And I believe you need to do both at the same time. Uh, yes, sir. Right, right back here. Wait, and wait for the mic, please. There's one coming this way. Congresswoman, thank you for coming and explaining uh, the daily work that you do in Congress. What I'd like to know, if you could share with us at this time, what Congress is proposing to do about a coming crisis in this country, dealing with the entitlement programs for the baby boom generation. Thank you for that question, because I think that's the, one of our number one topics we have to have. And if we shy from it, it's going to destroy our country, okay? Every time you hear a federal elected official, I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat, you should ask them, where's the entitlement program? And if they tell you nothing's wrong, what they just did was add 11, $11 trillion every year to the unfunded to the problem. It's roughly around 90 some right now, Social Security being about 5 trillion of it. Every year you ignore it, the problem gets bigger, the options get fewer. Okay? Every study that's done says they're going broke in a short time frame. On average, the government takes in 18% of GDP in revenue via taxes. During the financial crisis, we dipped down to about 14.1%. But on average, you take in 18%. If you simply put out a graph, and I think Tim keeps these on his Blackberry even to show you, if we do nothing in a short amount of time, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security will take every single dollar that comes in. That means every department you've ever found, military, everything else. And if you found every great, every big government in, in any society has always crumbled during finances because they ignored them, then they cut back on their investments, they cut back on their military, and pretty soon it was too far behind, and they lagged back behind. Republicans said, if we're going to become the majority, you've got to act like the majority. Now, we ran on the idea that here you are in the Senate under Harry Reid, you've had $1.5 trillion deficits, and they've never even produced a budget. 
Well, if you can't even produce a budget out of your own house in the majority, how are you ever going to tackle the big problems? So in four months, we wrote our budget. You probably heard about it. You probably heard we were criticized by it. And, and I think it's okay to criticize us if you want to, but if you criticize us, give us an, your idea. I mean, you know where I learned politics? Saturday morning, turning on the cartoon, Schoolhouse Rock. I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, right? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Okay, sit here and wait. Supposed to pass one house, goes to the other, they pass one, then you go into conference, then you get it through. So what we have said is entitlements are a big concern. One, because they're going bankrupt, and if you do nothing, they won't be there for you. So we're lying to you if we know the facts and we don't sit out there. So we said, okay, let's save them for those individuals and for the future. So what we say, if you're 55 or older right now, nothing will happen to you. There will be no difference whatsoever. But if you're 55 or younger, they're going to go bankrupt by then, so we're going to have to adjust. And there's two ways of doing it. You could take what the current administration proposed, where it's a panel of 15, and what they do, they just tighten down the screws. Meaning, I've only gotten this much money, so your options get fewer. All right? So that's, in the end, you get rationing. Or we say, why don't we use part of the private sector and part of the public sector at the same time? That we empower you. Now, in my hometown, I have a choice about five different cable companies. When I was in the legislature, I offered to open up the cable industry in California because I wanted greater choice. And what happens is my kids get more TiVo. I can buy a different package of things I want to watch, things I don't want to watch, certain football games or not. But I get to decide what that is. And I get to decide how much I pay, and people compete for that. Well, we believe we can do that as well. The other side goes out and says well, it's a voucher program. It's not a voucher program. The voucher program means we pay you. What we do, we'll pay the company. But they will compete to offer you different items. Because you know what? I have two kids, Connor and Megan, 17 and 14. When they were a little younger, I only cared about what insurance covered braces, right? As they get older, I want different options. I want different choices. We believe that can allow to drive the cost going further keep it lower to get more people to be able to get there. Then I think we have to think as a whole one other way. You always have people talking about what the cost of health care is. What about solving health care problems? My father died 12 years ago from cancer. I kept a binder because if you ever go through that, amount of chemo that costs each month, tremendous. And you've got to keep all the facts. What if we cured cancer? What if we did it the way Lindbergh went across the Atlantic? You know why Lindbergh went across the Atlantic? Because someone gave him a prize. Someone told me, that in my district, you got a quarter million dollars, you can go to space privately in a short amount of time. Some guys did it, the Rattan brothers, and they won $10 million. Cost them $30 million to do it, but now they're going to be on the other side of it as well. What if we gave as a country and said, cure cancer, cure heart disease? What would that do to the outcome of what Medicare would be able to have in the future as well. So I think we have to take it from a third perspective as well. Try to go after what are the greatest cost drivers and solve the problem, but also we've got to have the competition to be able to keep it there in the future. Now that's our idea. We produced it in a budget that would save them, and we put it out on the table. And we said, this is our idea. If you don't like our idea, offer another one. I sat down with the president, it was Boehner, Cantor myself with the vice president and um, Daly as chief of staff. And it was just outside the Oval Office right after we won the majority because we didn't have any type of relationship. We had this private conversation with him and we said, entitlements are a problem. He said, yes, they are. I know it's a political season, but you know what? If we go out together, we don't demonize in each other's ideas, but we, we acknowledge what the problem is and we tell the American public, here's the problem. Because the biggest problem that happens in Washington you get a budget gimmick, you get an accounting trick, and then you get broken promises. They tell you Social Security and Medicare will be there forever. Well, in the current system, it can't be. So we have a responsibility to be honest with everybody. Lay out all the facts, and I believe this country will come to a conclusion that we can get to solve the problem. If you have a better idea, lay out the idea as well. It's a question in the back right here. Hallie? Yes. I have one right here. Thank you so much for coming, uh, Congressman. Uh, my question is, um, well, two related questions, really. A criticism about the debt ceiling deal has been that there's not a revenue increase. And some say that the revenue increase should come from taxing the more wealthy Americans. And I just would like for you to comment on that. 
I look at a time. If you went where the Bush tax cuts were expiring, the president was president, Speaker Pelosi was speaker, and Reid was the leader. And they said no because the economy is in bad position. I watched the stock market just drop 500 points yesterday. The biggest driver of new jobs is small business. You will hit those who go in after 250. You'll get more than half of those are small business. And you know what's bad of the situation today? It doesn't have to be this way. If you look at other factors, I'm a person that always believes in matrix. Do you know corporations today in America have more cash on hand than they had in the last 50 years? But they're not making investment because of the uncertainty. We also live in a global economy where we punish them if they make profit in another country and want to bring it back to America. We charge them 35% while all the other countries charge 5%. That's a trillion dollars of stimulus that would be no borrowed money to come back. So I don't believe we need to raise revenues from a position of raising taxes. I believe you raise revenues by more people working. And the way to fundamentally do it is we step back. We don't fight for that one provision, oh, let's just lower the corporate tax rate. This is what I say. Maybe I'm a simple person. But I loved growing up watching the Olympics. I'd love to go to McDonald's and get that scratch off. You know, you scratch it off. If America won the 100-meter dash, I won fries or something like that, right? But you know why I love the Olympics? I didn't even complain if somebody beat us. Because in the Olympics, we all start on the same starting line and finish on the same finishing line. But in today's world, America does not. We are at a disadvantage. Our tax system punishes us from creating it in America. GE, who's the CEO, is the economic advisor to the president, shipped part of his jobs overseas. So I would do this. I'd take a step back. I'd say America competes with other countries. And we'll do this. Don't give us an advantage, but let's take the top countries we compete with, five, seven, ten. And let's just say on average, if it's three pieces of paper to start a new factory in this country on average, then it's three paces here. If it's this rate, then it's here. So you at least give America a fair chance. And I always believe we will win in that case. But when we micromanage and try to pinpoint that because we're going to punish somebody because they're successful, there's actions for that recourse. And I tell you this one answer. I'll give you two, two people that grew up in California when I gave you those examples. Tiger Woods grew up in California. Take away his private life, but he was a good golfer, right? Good golfer at a young age, could get a scholarship to any university he wanted to go to. He chose Stanford. Good education and still by his parents. But do you know Tiger Woods never bought a house in California? He left California not when he found a new house, but when he went pro. He went to Florida. The Williams sisters, great tennis players. You know where they learned to play tennis? In the parks of California. But they don't live there anymore. If you punish wealth creation, you'll get less of it. And that's why this concept that we need a tax increase, that you're going to get more revenue, no, what will happen is you'll get the reaction, they won't make the investment. What you want to do is unshackle what's holding us back. And it's, part of it is our tax equation, another part is our regulation. Most of the regulation that comes through doesn't come through Congress anymore, it comes through agencies. Now, Tim and I support a little bill in Congress that says this. If an agency has a new regulation, it gets scored about how much it'll cost business. If it reaches $100 million, it's called a major ruling. You know how many major rulings are out there in the last year? 93. 93 in this time. So we say this. No agency can enact a major ruling without a vote on by Congress. So the people have a say, a check and balance. All it would do is stop you digging in the hole, and then let's look at the other countries and be able to compete at the same time. So I don't believe the answer and if the, if, if the president really believed that was the answer, he would have raised those taxes when he had all the power just a few short months ago. I think it's chosen more from a political basis than it is a policy basis. Congressman, question. What, what do you see this playing out in 2012 with the commission? And how, how do you see that going? And then the expiration of the, of the Bush tax cuts. What, what do you, how do you see that? I see the commission overall being a very serious play. And I know you read a lot about, oh, it's a super Congress. No. What transpires here is we still have to vote on it. So there's a check and balance. Now, what is the firewall to make them do something? We put punishments on both sides that both parties dislike. So if they don't act, go across the board cuts. He'll hit defense, 
and it'll hit, it'll hit Medicare, it'll hit a lot of other things that people, people love. So the fear is, ooh, you don't want that, so we're going to have to get something done. Structure dictates behavior, all right? So now we've got a structure in there where we all know there's a problem. But the other, the other problem you have in the Senate, they have different rules, where it really takes 60 to do anything. That's why nothing ever gets done over there. I mean, I had a friend I came into Congress with, and he got appointed to the Senate. And I saw him in the gym the other day. I said, hey, what's it like going to the Senate? He said, it's like moving in with your grandparents, OK? So things are a little slower. But, <laughs> so what this does, though, if we agree to something, it's kind of like how we handled BRAC, base realignment. Because no one's going to vote to close their own military base, even though it's been around World War II. But it's not, it's not the best factor for the country as a whole. So as a whole, if it comes out, you get one vote up or down. And also in the Senate, it only takes 50. So we have laid a framework up. If we want to come together as one, we have the opportunity to do it. And we're in a point that it's going to take Republicans and Democrats to vote for it, so you're not going to demonize one another. That's why I believe we're at a turning point in this country, that we put a place up, we put an opportunity, and it's a time to move forward. Now, I will tell you that we won the majority by, being, by the public saying they didn't like the current policies going through. That doesn't mean they love our policies, but they want to see something together. Yeah, Congressman McCarthy, very much for being with us today.